so I ran out of time while I was reading this and I don't know how far I got but um, I uh, I think it's important literature that's all I have to say about that one so it's um, it's important to see that other people are different from you or maybe the same right because uh, James was mentioning to me a while ago that he thinks that um, pornography is important because what was it that you said something about um, so like when a, important? well maybe not important I don't know what you, you can correct it once I've tried to spit it out in a certain way um, because then like for uh, a, a young man or whatever might think that they're abnormal or or I guess a woman whatever might think that they're um, mutants or that they're not like say uh, a, a man might have or a young man might have a penis that is a certain size and they may think oh I'm microscopic but really they're normal or maybe they're huge and really they they still thought that they were small for some reason or and they were embarrassed to show it or they thought oh is it supposed to look like this maybe I'm you know and it's important for them to see that no they're fine mm. something like that mm. is that what uh, you said something? Mm, well you know they were asking uh, Monica Lewinsky or someone like that which way uh, Bill Clinton's uh, penis hung so um, did she tell I can't remember. I, there was some sort of issue. Maybe it wasn't that sort of thing. And uh, if uh, one is exposed to enough porn images, one realizes that, uh, yeah, they can kind of hang this way and that. And uh, it doesn't seem that freaky or whatever. So uh, that's just uh, one example. A women might have an innie. And uh, they yeah. realize, holy smokes, you know. Like, uh, or they might have an Audi and think it's kind of freaky. But... Uh, there are all sorts of levels of freakiness and stuff like that. I won't get go into the details, but uh, uh, you know, it it can be that way. Although, like with size, maybe that wasn't the best example because guys would get a skewed uh, kind of or screwed up uh, kind of oh. image of what's average for okay, a guy. Okay, yeah. You know, so. I maybe didn't make a good example. And it's the same sort of thing with women. Uh, and uh, how well endowed they are. You yes. Know, like, uh, because they a, probably have bigger boobs. Uh, that'd be if they were natural and then of course I think nowadays I don't know since when about the last 20 years for a while it was illegal for in the United States uh, for the enhancements to take place but then I think it was made legal again and I don't know what it's like now but it probably looks ridiculous right? a lot of oh and another thing women. that I appreciate about Pat Calippi is she is very much about use safe practice safe sex and um I mean, when you think about the average, uh, James was telling me that in California, they just struck, struck down, or when was it? They struck there was down. a referendum, I don't know how recently, uh, you know, to requiring uh, the porn industry, much of it in the United States just hails right out of California, I think uh, two main centers would be the Bay Area, Los Angeles, and uh, they, the referendum was to require uh, all outfits producing uh, porn to require their actors to uh, use condoms. And the people of California, well, there was, of course, they elected uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger as governor, I think, at least twice. Uh, they, uh, and Ronald Reagan, but back in the day, um, uh, they struck that down. I'm just saying, yeah, we, we kind of like our, our guys riding bareback. So. So that's the public, stupid. right? Yeah, the so public. she's, so the public, a lot of them would think, oh, she's outrageous. And I've, um, I've read some of the, some some things that people have said about Pat Calipia, who, oh, I should point out, um, is has went through like in this book, the second edition, edition. She's talking about how she's about to go through. Um, uh, sex change. So. When was that? Ninety-eight or something. Like that? Uh, two thousand. 
So mm. it was ninety four was when it was written, of and course. then the second edition would be two thousand. Yeah. So, so when she was, she, was uh, she just started. It, I mean, yeah. I, I think in nineteen. So she was already taking the hormones mm -hmm. then. But anyway, so um, and there's a lot of people that I mean, she started out. Uh, she was submissive. Well, she started out. She was Mormon, and she moved from Utah. And, uh, a Mormon woman, I guess. She, she comes yeah. to submission, naturally. Yes, so she started out into S&M in the submissive role. And then she moved on, and oh, I should point out lesbian. Um, and then she moved on to uh, being the saddest. And then um, she also gets off on wearing leather and um she's not ex not um although she finds women more attractive she's not hard and fast she calls herself a kenzie five so um if there's a man who is into the particular thing she's into she, she's good with that um and um if there's a if they're a part of, she's only really into a man if they're part of the gay community somehow. So there's some, she has a lot of, a lot of people have problems with her because she's, and now him, um, because of the gender fluidity, mostly. It, because people don't wanna see, um, they don't want to accept that, that that's possible or something. I don't know. But um, I'm going to mention a few things from public sex because I've just spent so much time on macho slots. Uh, and I actually, if you're going to read a Pat Califia book, and I have over this um, LB whatever, I've... LGBTQ? Yeah. I have suggested, I've went through three... Uh, of her books, and actually, uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that they're the best or anything. Uh, they're just three that I happen to borrow. I can see for why this. you want. To, sorry, I can see why you want to finish it up because it's the last of June. Yes, it is. Today. It's the last of June, yeah. so I've I've really been taking my time about this because I don't know exactly what to say, and I don't mm. want to seem like I'm not supportive because honestly. I think she is more of a feminist, or now he, than a lot of people who are shouting from the mountaintops that they're feminists. So, um, but there's different kinds of feminism and whatever. But um, I think what what's actually happening with what. Um, I think the main problem, how we're losing feminism, is that we're losing femmes. We're lo losing feminine femininity and uh, submissive. And her, okay, so she um, says at one point she talks about how um, the majority of women. Uh, this is page 171, and this is of this book. Uh, the majority of women and men involved in SM prefer to play bottom. I have not found that to be case. Um, if if you're a submissive, and you're very obviously so, you get so many dominance. Just your I'm dance cards flow. You're not necessarily flow. talking about us. And just no, talking about, uh, I'm just talking about know. dominance in general. Sure. So it's uh, a lot of people aren't into their not. You're talking particularly about into, guys, uh, yeah. right, just lining up to take advantage. So. I'm not talking about guys in particular. I'm women talking too. about women too. Oh, yeah. And there are our whole society is, and unless you have been through this this makes it really clear if you've been in one of these kind of relationships at some point you come come out of it going wow I understand now and you can see all around you what's really happening in society and uh, so it's very educational I guess that was kind of my experience you know 
Yeah, I was enumerating all the women who kind of like. I'm very uh, kind mm -hmm. of laid back kind of person. Uh, Pauline's the first woman I've ever asked out, you know. And I was about what? How old was that? Forty-eight or so, forty-nine years old. Yeah, it was always the one I, I insisted, kind of like the women asking you. And uh, there were quite a few, and some of them got kind of pushy, you know. Yeah. So. Uh, well, they were dominants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly right. And uh, it's a lucky thing, I think, that you ended up with another submissive. Well, it's not. And it's, it's a lucky it's, thing it's, I ended up with a submissive it's, too. It's not luck. It's just that's the way it worked out. Yeah. You know, I made sure it worked out though. No, it's very good that you... See, when James and I got together, I had left a relationship with a dominant, and it was... I had been with him for 13 and a half years, and really, I should have been with him for half a year, but I was a submissive, and um, he very much needed me to be. Uh, so, it, um, it went on and on, and... When I was done with that, then I really wanted to be alone. I did not, I wasn't looking for another relationship, but being a submissive, it, I don't know if that would have really been possible. I mean, anytime I've been single or even not, it's, uh, I get a lot of attention and not now so much now that I'm in my forties, I'm pretty much invisible, which is kind of great. <laughs> Pauline um, doesn't see what's happening, what's going on behind her back. But, uh, yeah, she Well, they're not that. approaching me anymore. No, it's a different, but they're still noticing, so. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny, but young but, pups, older No, pups. it used to be terrible. In, in my 20s and in my teens, I, well, in my teens, I didn't understand what was happening. Um, so it wasn't annoying then. It was heartbreaking, you know. It, in like a roller coaster of heartbreak and anyway but um then yeah in my 20s it got to be i got uh, really annoyed by it um because i i by then i could see what was happening and i i was not very fond of it but anyway what was i going to say um Oh, so I don't agree with her that maybe in the case of, like, maybe in her world where it's casual sex, maybe there's, and maybe at that time, maybe people, maybe uh, there were few tops in play because they didn't want to be, they didn't want to risk somebody pressing charges, uh, frankly. Maybe they were smart enough. Oh, I said something rude. I shouldn't have said that. But, um... Maybe they, to avoid possible or perhaps probable prosecution, maybe they um, just found submissives and hung on to them for, say, 13 and a half years. Um, so, uh, 172, very few bottoms want full-time mistresses. In fact, masochists are known within the SM community to be stubborn and aggressive. Tops often make nervous jokes about being slaves to the whims of their bottoms. After all, the top's pleasure is dependent on the bottom's willingness to play. This gives most status a mild to, to severe case of performance anxiety. And it's, I, I don't know if I, I, I can't really comment on that. Um, I, don't, I don't think I'm stubborn and aggressive. Um, I don't, uh, it might seem that it. way. No. I don't know. Something <laughs> weird's going on there. I don't think uh, most uh, dominant guys, for example, uh, have uh, much performance anxiety. Maybe they do. But, uh, and 163, she says, My lover slave has her cunt shaved. It reminds me her reminds her that I own her genitals and reinforces her role as my child and property. This one is that so this is, you know, some of the stuff she says I have a tough time with. That one's creepy, and that's three syllables on that one. Yes. For us, this is hard. Hard mm. to get through, this sort of thing. So, But it's important. It's important to know that other people don't think the same way that we do. Mm. Um, 
she says 164 bottoms tend to be anxious and they also like to feel greedy and guilty they get anxious about that so well she claims she's been there but uh, i don't know I think she might be generalizing from a sample of one. Maybe she is that way. But who knows? I don't know. Oh, she did talk about, in this book, one thing I found interesting. Well, there's a few things. Um, page 29, AIDS patient characteristics, gay bisexual males represent 73% of total cases, 70%, 17% IV drug users, 1% hemophiliacs, 1% heterosexual sex, uh, 2% transfusion, 7% were none of the above. And some of these, they could have been more than one of the things that they checked off. 143, Spanner case. And this one was interesting. Uh, and I don't know anything about it. So besides what I've read in the book, Judge James Rant ruled that consent was no defense against the assault charges. Some of the bottoms were actually convicted of aiding and abetting assaults against themselves. And that's just insane to for me to hear that anyway and that was i think it was great britain she was talking about that where that took place so you could look that up s-p-a-n-n-e-r i don't know anything about it um yeah great britain's uh, pretty weird so yeah. i'm not going to go into the, one of the recent decisions but. 151 many theoretical utopias are dreamed up by people who are afraid of diversity and deeply conservative about sex furthermore they seem to think they can create tolerance by wiping out or minimizing differences they envision worlds where men and women could barely be told apart so of course there would be no sexism so um and then she says a bunch of things i don't before know. Uh, you move oh. on i i think that's uh an important point. I mean, uh, we've got this idea in the left wing that uh, utopian, of course, utopian is a, uh, a form of abuse with Marx, a utopian uh, socialism. But uh, it, he was a utopian too. It, it ended up, uh, anyone who followed him and actually was able to institute anything in this world were dystopians. They made a dystopia, the opposite of utopia. But uh, there's this idea that utopians are uh, so many left wingers. Utopian is their left wing, you know. But uh, you know, biblical stuff is utopian. Uh, Quranic stuff is utopian. You know? Utopia is after the end of things, stuff like that. Uh, just because a person's got a, some sort of a fantastic dream about how things are going to be equal and all this kind of stuff and uh, not so much democratic uh, a good substantial trench of left wingers self-proclaimed left wingers that today don't believe in democracy they're profoundly against really and it goes back to uh, lenin who called uh, people who believed in democracy parliamentary cretins um, uh, almost any utopian is going to be a right winger though when it actually comes to uh, to uh, imposing their utopia on anyone and uh, to me, I, it doesn't matter what their aims are, it's what their means are. I, I don't care if uh, the aims are left wing, if their means are right wing, forget it. So even Marx, you know, he said, I'm going to use the state against the state, or we're going to use the state against the state. Yeah, how are you going to get rid of the state that he's using, uh, which would be like militias, military, police, their, their own military, their own police. And that was a problem uh, with the uh, Soviet Union, still a problem. In, uh, in uh, China, problem in uh, Cuba, problem in Venezuela, problem in uh, Rhodesia, uh, Zimbabwe. It'll be a problem with the ANC, mark my words, in uh, South Africa. So um, how do you get rid of that state? You know, like if you actually believe in using the state, uh, either as a right winger uh, to impose the state or get rid of it in the case of uh, fake left wingers, um, you're not a left winger to me. So, anyway. Um, page 166. There's a bunch of things here that I don't necessarily agree with, but I thought they were worth talking about. Um, these are quotes. SM roles are not related to gender or sexual orientation or race or class. class and that's a good point to make. Our political system cannot digest the concept of power unconnected to privilege. And I don't know that that's... 
entirely true. But um, governments are based on sexual control. Any group of people that gains access to author authoritarian power becomes an accessory to that ideology. These groups begin to perpetuate and enforce sexual control. Women and gays who are hostile to other sexual minorities are siding with fascism. She says. So. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Annie, eventually someone has got these utopias and have got this idea they're going to impose their utopia. They're right-wings, they're fascists, they're whatever. In many ways they're worse because fascists aren't you know, someone was talking about uh, totalitarianism not existing in reality. I'm going, no, there's no such thing as a pole of totalitarianism where it's totally totalitarian. But there are regimes that are more totalitarian than others. Fascism tended to be less totalitarian than Nazism. Nazism was more virulent when it came to people, particularly outsiders outside of Germany, uh, getting killed. But uh, Nazism, if you actually look at it objectively, I'm a left winger, but I look at it objectively and it's nothing by comparison with the totalitarianism of, uh, let's say, the Soviet Union or of uh, China. What happened was the, um, the uh, Nazis in Germany kind of left the religious sphere alone. You know, they have concord out with the, uh, with the Pope, you know, you mind your business, we'll mind ours. But uh, the... Uh, communists in Russia, they didn't leave religion alone. Uh, you look at the I industry, the econ economic sphere in uh, Germany. It was, uh, you know, the United States was more into controlling their economy, despite the fact that they were controlling capitals in World War II. They were doing it before the Germans were. It wasn't until Albrecht or Albert Speer started doing it kind of in the middle of uh, World War II that the Germans started uh, totalitarianizing their economy. Well, I don't have to tell you what the Russians were doing. They were doing it even before World War II. How much did the Americans uh, totalitarianize their economy? You know how Americans love their cars? This was in the 40s. Going back to the beginning of the 20s, they were loving their cars, loving them to death. So and so you can check it out. Check how many cars the Americans produced. In, like passenger vehicles they produced in 1944. I don't think it was over a thousand. That's for all of the United States. They were serious about churning out as many tanks, as many uh, uh, guns, as many uh, munitions, as many planes as possible. And uh, that's how they clamped down on the economy. I don't think uh, uh, Ford and Chrysler and uh, General Motors was necessarily that happy about that, but uh, they knuckled under. But the, the, the Nazis were even less into controlling their economy than the Americans were, from what I can tell. But the Russians were amazing. And that's just religion and economy. We can go into controlling the army. With the the Germans, what they did was they had the, the uh, Night of the Long Knives sometime in 34, something like that, where they control, where they killed off select guys they figured weren't reliable in the army. The Americans had nothing like that. The Russians, of course, uh, I don't know what level they went down to, but you had a commissar who's a member of the Communist Party there, and he had a gun. And if you didn't do, if you were a general or things lower down too, you didn't, didn't do what the commissar figured he liked, boom, you get popped, you got popped. And we could just go down the list. The, uh, the Soviet system was way more totalitarian than even the Nazi system. So I'm distinguished between virulence and totalitarianism. Now, the Soviet system tended to be pretty virulent. It killed off tens of millions of people. Uh, but, uh, and it was a similar sort of thing, although it was different from the Soviet system in China. Tens of millions of people in a uh, pretty short time. So it came in gulps, you know, like uh, the uh, various famines and stuff like that, the purges and the Cultural Revolution in China. Uh, there was a lot of incompetence, but there's no excuse for the incompetence in China. They'd seen what had happened with collectivization in Russia, the two big gulps of it are, are, are around 1920 and around 1930, and uh, no excuse for it. Okay. All out again? No, it's still okay, going. Still. So I can mention a few other things. There's couple minutes left, I think. Um, 
uh, there's a quote, one, page 169 to 70. I believe that society in which I live is a patriarchy with power concentrated in the hands of men and that this patriarchy actively prevents women from being complete and independent human beings. Women are oppressed by being denied access to economic resources, political power, control over their own reproduction. This oppression is managed by several institutions, chiefly the family, religion, and the state. An essential part of the oppression of women is control over sexual ideology, mythology, and behavior. The rewards of male dominance are given only to men who are willing and able to perpetuate and cooperate within the system. And I don't entirely disagree with this, but, um, like, because I think right now, well, what's been happening, uh, actually since the 70s, so I think it's been happening the whole time that, like, when she was writing this, it was full um, underway. Uh, I think that a lot of dominant women who consider themselves feminists are actually um, helping eradicate feminism, actually, because they're um, overpowering feminine women and just it's the only people that end up um, having children are either, if they're not in a religious um, relationship uh, of, of monogamous uh, um, say a monogamous Christian relationship or something like that but it could be other religion um, then the only the only single mothers out there are going to be the dominants pretty much and they're raising dominant children there's no other um, so with a traditional kind of relationship you have the influence of the dominant and the submissive and to this is the extreme of it is the s and m but you know you if you look at it just uh from a standpoint of butch bam or whatever that's traditional what's expected and there's lots of i mean she talks about um other uh sexuality more, human beings come in more models than xx or xy one page 184 and she's right but this is what has been traditionally viewed as uh, the family unit is the the mother who is expected to be femme, the father who's expected to be masculine, and um, you know, and uh, according to their genitals, perhaps. But anyway, um, like this is not always the case. We, if you look at it, if you actually look at the world around you look at the people that you know closely like my my father wasn't p particularly masculine he was submissive quite submissive um but he did not want to be he kind he fought that within himself he wanted to be the head of the household you know and he wanted us to recognize him as such and um my grandfather was submissive james is submissive so men are not necessarily sub um, dominant, you know. But your grandma wasn't dominant. My grandma wasn't dominant, it even though she was with. It was a very good relationship, it, you know? and this is what I ended up striving towards. And it was. Um, I wish that I'd found James sooner, but I don't know if I would have appreciated what I had, and I'm so that makes me just thankful that I found him when I did, because now I still have him. Because when I did find him, I was certainly appreciative of who he was and I knew exactly what I had um, where when you're young you don't you don't make great decisions right and so I'm worried about that or I'm 